I'd like to welcome you in case I haven't met you yet. My name is Dustin, and I have the privilege of opening God's Word with you this morning. And we're going to spend about 30 minutes reading the Word, letting the Word read us, and asking God, okay, what is it that you want me to do? The, the series that we're walking through is a series about the Holy Spirit, and, and the Holy Spirit sometimes is a big question mark. I mean, you can attend church your whole life and still have a big question mark next to what is the Holy Spirit all about? What does the Holy Spirit do? Who is the Holy Spirit? And so through this series, we're just going through God's word and we're opening it and we're looking at what it has to say. And then we're looking at our lives. We're saying, okay, am I living out what the word says about the Holy Spirit? Do I have that relationship, that connection? Do I understand who the Holy Spirit is? Because I would like to see Thrive Church move from having the Holy Spirit as a question mark to having the Holy Spirit as an exclamation mark. Because we as Thrive Church have to be led by the Holy Spirit to be the church that God calls us to be. Well, one of the things the Holy Spirit isn't, let me, let me share this little story with you, right? I, I think this is an example of what the Holy Spirit isn't. Do you, do you see the picture behind me? Who is that guy? Tim Tebow. Tim Tebow, right? Tim Tebow. Listen, I'm a fan of Tim Tebow. I like Tim Tebow. I didn't like him when he played for Florida, but after he got out of college, I liked Tim Tebow more. And, and you know what? I'm a fan. And sometimes when coming to a hard decision on a, on a ballot, I'll write Tim Tebow's name in as somebody to vote for, right? That's how big of a fan I am of Tim Tebow. But there was a Tim Tebow 316 game. Anybody remember that? The 316 game? First service, we had a couple people raise their hands. They remembered the 316 game. It happened in 2011. The Pittsburgh Steelers, any Steelers fans here? All right, it's going to be a little painful. I'm sorry, we're going to talk about this game, right? The Pittsburgh Steelers were playing the the Broncos, the Denver Broncos. It was the first round playoff game. Tim Tebow was coming, he came in as the quarterback for the Broncos. And, And one of the things he did all throughout college, if you knew much about Tim Tebow, you would know he was a missionary's kid. His parents were missionaries in the Philippines. You would know a bit of his background. And in fact, like the doctors were advising his mom to, to abort the baby when he was in her womb because there was a, a complication. And the mom said, I'm going to choose life through this. We're going to choose to have the baby. And, and like all this great parts of his story come together. He's a great athlete. He was driven. He was determined. And he was a strong believer. And so he would wear under his eyes on those eye patch there, the black eye patches there, he, he would wear, what, what does it say? Right? That was like one of the things he would do. He would write Bible references. He would write verses on there. He would, he would use it as a platform to be able to declare that he was a follower of Jesus. And I love that about him. And so first round game, the 316 game, guess what happened? He threw for a total of 316 yards that game. Right? And the average per uh, completion was 31.6 yards. And the Steelers had the ball for a period of 31 and and 6 seconds, right? So the possession. And they found the TV ratings at that point to be one of the highest TV ratings of the playoff game series with a 31.6 viewership. And that spiked right at the moment Ben Roethlisberger threw an interception when the Steelers had a third down and... 16 yards to go, and it was picked off by the Broncos. And it went to overtime, and the Broncos beat the Steelers 11 seconds into overtime. Tim Tebow threw the game-winning touchdown. All of those stats, right? You look at that, and you're like, man, he wore 316 on his eye patch, and that must have been the Holy Spirit, and that must have been God working, and that's what the Holy Spirit does. He lets you win football games. Well, what about the... Games Penn State never won. Where was the Holy Spirit on those games, right? Why did Ohio State beat Penn State so much? Why did my team lose? Why doesn't God let me win? Why doesn't God let this happen? It must be the Holy Spirit's fault. The Holy Spirit shows up and gives me the shivers and the willies, and I feel it, and it makes me get you know, the hair stand up in the back of my neck. Is that, is that what the Holy Spirit's all about? You see, remember I said the Holy Spirit's kind of like a big question mark. Well, I don't think Tim Tebow's 316 game was the Holy Spirit. I think it was a statistical anomaly. <laughs> I think that's what happened. It's like, well, that's crazy. You can, you can work numbers to make numbers say what you want them to say, right? You can make appearances and situations say what you want them to say. I believe when the Holy Spirit shows up and the Holy Spirit works in your life and in my life, as believers, we look more like Jesus. I believe when the Holy Spirit does what the Holy Spirit says he's going to do and the Holy Spirit lives out what the Word of God says, We love God more, and we love others more. I believe that's what the Holy Spirit is about. It's about changing us every day 
not just at certain moments and certain places, at certain powerful times, right? I, I think God's in control of everything, but what the Holy Spirit wants to do most in you and in me is to make us look more like Jesus. So let's jump into the sermon here. I think as we look back a little bit, let me catch up to speed in case you missed the last couple of messages. The Holy Spirit has been given to believers as a counselor, a comforter, and a helper. Jesus said, it's for your benefit, it's for your gain that I'm going to go up to heaven. And so the church was told to wait for someone to come a counselor, a helper, a comforter. And they're going to come and they're going to give you power. They're going to give you life. They're going to give you connection. So you need to wait for this, this Holy Spirit that's coming. And so that's what we saw. The Holy Spirit is another of the same kind. It's, it's another Jesus. And your brain's like, hold on, wait a minute. I don't feel comfortable saying there's two Jesuses. There can only be one Jesus. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me, right? There's one Jesus. But Jesus says, but there's somebody you haven't met yet. He's another of the same kind, he's the Holy Spirit. He's coming to, into you to give you a relationship, a connection, to give you life. Because without the Holy Spirit, we are spiritually dead. So yes, you can be physically alive, but spiritually dead. No connection to God. Your heart can be beating. You can be walking around and living and moving. However, you don't have a spiritual life until you cross that line of faith, until you believe, you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. At that moment, you've received the Holy Spirit when you believed, and that's when everything changes. So that leads us up to where we're going. What changes and why do we get the Holy Spirit and what are we supposed to do? What, what does God actually want us to do? And so here's the answer to that question. The answer to the question is the Holy Spirit helps us what? Can you say that for me? And let's try that again. The Holy Spirit helps us what? And love others. That's the purpose. That's the point. That's how the Holy Spirit comes in to change who we are, to make us who God wants us to be, to help us reflect the image of Jesus, and to be the church that God's called us to be. There's a lot to be said in that simple statement. We're called to love God and to love others. So where do we get that? We get that from the Word of God. If you have your Bibles this morning, you can turn to Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 to 40. And if you want to, I'll set up the passage. Here's what happened in this passage that we're going to take a look at. Jesus is surrounded by a large group of people. They're asking him questions. They're trying to trip him up. They're trying to get him to say something that will divide his audience and cause a riot and a disagreement and a fight. And they're trying to, to work sneakily here because maybe he might blunder so bad they can stone him with stones. They can kill him, right? They're trying to trick him. It's a trap. And they ask him a trick question in order to get him to, to stumble, right? I mean, some questions there's no answer to. I have three kids. Which one do I love the most? Well, turn my mic off, I'll tell you. No, you can't answer that question, right? You can't, it's like, well, I, I don't know, who do I love the most, right? Now, maybe, you know, gentlemen, you've been there, your wife's like, how does this dress make me look? You're like, I don't know how to answer that question, right? It's a trick question, right? There, there's situations, there's like safe and unsafe here, right? And so Jesus is getting set up with a trick question, with a trap. And here's the trap. It's like, Jesus, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, they all come together, and an expert of the law, a lawyer, he's testing Jesus with the question, and he says, teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? In all of the Old Testament, right, the first part of the Bible, bunch of laws, bunch of rules, all kinds of stuff that you're supposed to do and not do, which one of those is the greatest you might know, be sitting there and like, well, I mean, that's kind of a silly question. Like, I mean, why is that such a big deal? Because if Jesus would answer one law is better than the other, well, then it would look like he had a favorite passage, or maybe it seemed like one wasn't important and the other was important. He, they were trying to, to trick him, to trap him, to cause division, to get the great crowd of people to start yelling and fighting with each other and discredit Jesus as a teacher. It, it was a no-win situation. And here's the answer Jesus gave coming out of a no-win situation. You ready? On the screen behind me, Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all your what? And with all your what? And with all your? This is the first and greatest commandment, right? There's answer, which is the great, there it is. But then he links it real quick. He keeps talking. <laughs> here's number one, and the other is just like it. 
The second is just like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. All of the law and prophets hang on these two commands. So what Jesus conveys, this whole book can be summarized into four words. Number one, the first two words, love God, right? The other two words, love others. If we are loving God and loving others, we are keeping all of the commands in this book. We are keeping all of the commands in this book. And if Jesus said the Holy Spirit's coming to be your helper, what do you think the Holy Spirit is helping you do? Number one? Number two? That's what the Holy Spirit is here for. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. That's why the Holy Spirit has been given to us. Not to put 316 on our eye black and to go win playoff games and to make you know, uh, statistical anomalies happen, right? All that stuff can happen, but that's not the why. So this morning as a church at Thrive Church, the why that I want to share with you is you have the Holy Spirit to change and to help you in your connection to God and to change your connection to others. The Holy Spirit is there to help you, to give you power, to give you the ability to know the conviction, the discernment, the wisdom, all of that comes out of the Holy Spirit. That relationship you have with the Holy Spirit in your heart is there to help you love God and to love others. So that's what I see. Now, now, here's the good news. Here's the good news. The Holy Spirit-empowered love is the most excellent way. You see, the bad news is if I say, listen, you need to try hard enough. You need to work hard enough. You need to love God with everything that's in you. Well, that's still not enough. And then you need to love your neighbor with everything that's in you. Well, sometimes I get mad at my neighbor. <laughs> you need to love your kids. Sometimes I get mad at my kids. You need to love your spouse. Sometimes I get mad at your spouse. You need to love yourself. Sometimes I get mad at myself, right? All of those things happen together. It's like, I can't do this. Answer, you're right, you can't. You cannot love God the way God wants you to love by, by yourself. You need the Holy Spirit's help to change you, transform you, to make you spiritually alive. You cannot love your neighbor as yourself without the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit's there to help you do the most excellent way. But what is that? What, what does that look like? Well, it actually is coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and it's a passage that's read at marriages. If you've ever been to a wedding, these weddings that happen, like you hear this passage, it's very famous, it's very popular, but it's not just tied to a marriage relationship. This is what love is defined as. And if God, who is love, called us to love others with his love, and he gives us the Holy Spirit to do it, here's what it looks like to have Holy Spirit-empowered love. Start in verse Chapter 12, verse 31, it says, And yet I show you the most excellent way. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor, dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil, but it rejoices with truth. It always protects always trusts, always hopes, and always perseveres. You see, if you're a Christ follower and you've confessed with your mouth, you've believed in your heart, you've crossed the line of unbelief to belief, the Holy Spirit's come into you, that passage is what the Holy Spirit helps you to do, to love others. And you're loving others and it's overflowing because God, the Heavenly Father, has shown you love. What kind of love has God shown me? Love that's perfect. It's kind. It's, it keeps no record of wrong. It does, it's not easily angered, right? It, 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 like it goes on and on and on. That's what we're receiving from our connection to God. And that's what we're able to show to others because it's coming from God through us and it's going out horizontally. So the vertical connection to God is where our eyes are set on God. Our eyes are set on God's word. Our eyes understand who God is, and it comes into us so then it can go out from us. The Holy Spirit makes that connection possible. But why do we as Christians struggle then to love people like we should? Well, why do we as believers struggle? If, if God makes it this simple and this clear and this plain, four words, right? Love God, love others. Why do we mess it up so much? Why am I so imperfect? Why do I struggle with being a jerk? 
Why can't I seem to, to keep my heart where it should be, to keep my eyes where it should be, keep my hands where they should be, right? To keep, right? Why is life such a struggle? Answer, distractions. Distractions. Take our eyes off of God, and when our eyes are off of God, we're looking somewhere else, and the thing we're looking at is changing who we are, and then we're not loving people the way God wants us to love. But maybe this will help you kind of summarize. This is why what we look at is so important. On, on the screen behind me, it says, because what you give your attention to is the person you become. That's such a good parenting line to teach your kids. This is why it matters what you look at on social media. This is why it matters what you watch on YouTube. This is why it matters who your friends are. Because what you give your attention to is the person you become. Put another way, catch this, the mind is the portal to the soul. And what you fill your mind with will shape the trajectory of your character. In the end, your life is no more than the sum of what you gave your attention to. I think some of us are being more shaped by social media than by God's word. I think others of us are being more shaped by the news cycle, 24-7 news is coming out, than by God's word. I think some of us, we're being shaped and influenced by people and relationships, the people we work with and friends we hang out with. We're being more shaped by that than by God's word. And your mind is being centered on this, and your mind's being focused, and it's a portal right to your soul, and it hits you at the soul level. So when our eyes come off of God and we're not loving God and we don't see God as he's loving us, our, our inability then keeps us from loving others the way God wants us to love others. And then we struggle with the system because we're distracted. Do you know who knows that we're distracted? The Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit knows where we're struggling and where we're stumbling and where we're, we're split to vision and where our mind is like we're, we're, we're just an unstable person in all that we do because our minds are divided, our hearts are divided. The simple command has been distracted from and we're struggling with trying to navigate our way with a divided heart. And that's what I think the Holy Spirit wants to do. The Holy Spirit wants to help us get our eyes back on God because what our mind is thinking about is a portal to our soul. Now, here's the good news. Maybe you're hearing, like, I'm a distracted individual. I'm a distracted person. I'm a double-minded man. I I'm, I'm divided in what I do, and there's no hope. I've been stuck this way for the last 15 years. See, see the hope is <laughs> you got community around you. you got other believers around you. You've got other people with the Holy Spirit in them here to try to help you keep your eyes where they need to be, right? If we're going to love God, we have to be among the people of God. If I'm going to be a Christ follower, I need to be with other people who are following Christ. If I'm going to keep my mind and my eyes where they need to be, I need encouragement and support and accountability with other people that are also moving in that direction. So I love God better when I'm with people that love God, and I love others better when I'm with people that love others the way God wants me to love. Does that make sense? And so the Holy Spirit, when you gather Christians together, it's almost like the Holy Spirit in all of us help us experience what God wants us to experience. We need the church. It takes the church. But the church has to look like Jesus. The church has to look like Jesus. And so here's a thought. We're shifting gears, all right? We're shifting gears. Listen, think about this. Love only happens in community. So God wants to love me, yes. But God doesn't want to just say, well, okay, I love you, you love me, we're good. We don't need anybody else. Because I know some Christians sometimes say, God and I are good, that's all that matters. And I'm left scratching my head saying, really? What about your broken relationship with that person? <laughs> what, what about this issue in your life? What about, like, God's not okay with that. God's not good with that. And so we look at that, we're like, well, well but God and I are good. And God's like, no, no, that's not actually how it works. God is love, and when God's love comes upon us, we then have to love others in community. It, it takes community to be able to receive love and to show love. If you and God are good, it's not love that you have, it's self-love. And self-love is narcissism. And self-love is messed up. You ever know people that love themselves a little bit too much? And they're consumed with themselves, and they think about everything they do and everything they want, and everything's built around them, and they're revolving that way. And it's like, wait a minute, God didn't call us to a relationship where it's all about you and God, which really means it's all about you, which means you're a narcissist, and everything about you has to make you happy. That's not what the church is called to be. The church is the church when we're in community with others, and we understand how love really works. 
Now let me give you this passage. 1 John chapter 4, verse 7, it says, Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world so that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved God, but he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sin. You see, God started the love process by showing us love. And then we receive that love, and that process continues when we show others that same love. And the Holy Spirit is in us to help us love God, yes, and to help us love others, yes, both, not, not one or the other. It's not A or B, it's A and B, and they go together because love only happens in a community because in a community, I can practice these things. Well, what things? Well, number one, it takes other people for me to love one another right? It takes other people for me to be able to love one another. John 13, 34, Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I've loved you, so you must love one another. God loves, I love. Do you see that? How do I love? I love as I have been loved. I love as I have been loved, and the Holy Spirit's in there helping me understand God loves you this much. You need to go love others the same way. It takes a community for us to forgive one another. So, so as a community, as a church, we have to be willing to forgive each other. Colossians 3.13, bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against somebody else, go ahead. Who, who do you have an grievance against this morning? Go ahead, point the finger like that person, this person, that, right? If any of you have a grievance, okay, we got grievances. What do we do? It says, forgive as the Lord forgave you. Has God forgiven me? Yes. Has God forgiven you? Yes. That same forgiveness goes out. Vertical to horizontal. My relationship with God to me and then me in my relationship with others. It takes community for that to happen. You have the Holy Spirit to help that happen. We need to carry each other's burdens. Galatians 6, 2, it says, carry each other's burdens, listen to this, and in the same way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Love God, love others. If I'm helping others, I'm carrying their burdens, I'm walking beside them, I'm caring for them, I'm in community with them, when I'm doing that, I'm actually showing love in community because I need to carry other people's burdens to help them when they're weak, to come beside, to encourage, to, to say, you know what, you're not alone, don't give up, don't throw in the towel. I need to operate in community with other people and that's where love happens. 1 Peter 3.8, live in harmony. Guys, I think the ability for our church to live in harmony is what lets our church shine the light its brightest. We live in a world today that is more divided than ever. You give me two minutes to talk to somebody, I'll tell you, I don't agree with them politically, I don't agree with them economically, I don't agree with them on their sports team, I don't agree with their system of education, I don't agree with the type of car that they drive, I don't agree with the restaurant that they eat at, I don't agree with the height that they mow their lawn at, I don't agree, right? We just don't agree. We just don't agree. And, and what do we do? We go on social media and we tell everybody about everything we don't agree with. And in comments and in sections, we're like, well, you're an idiot. No, you're an idiot. Well, you're a bigger idiot. No, you're the biggest idiot. Like, we, we, if our church understood, love God, love people, Holy Spirit's in there, and we're called to one faith, to one baptism, to one word, to one gospel, to one Bible, to one spirit, and we're called to all of that, that Holy Spirit's where our eyes are focused, and it's calling us all to the same point. And we're following the same voice. And it's giving us the ability, 1 Peter 3, 8, to live in harmony. Listen, Peter says, finally, all of you, be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. So when I'm loving God, it's helping me love others. And as I'm loving others with that same love, it's helping me live in harmony with them. Do you guys know what harmony is? Because I'm not a musician. I need your help. Do you know what harmony is? It's when there's two notes that do what? They complement each other, right? They're not the same note, right? 
Jingle bells, I can do that. Jingle bells, jingle bells. It's like the same note, right? Harmony is when you start to use different notes to come together to accomplish an overall sound. And so we as a church have different people, different voices, different hearts, different backgrounds, different lives. However, God takes all of the different with the Holy Spirit in us and he makes us live in harmony together. The like mind called to care and to love and to support and to work and to model exactly what Jesus has done for us. Our church does not look like Jesus if our church does not experience harmony. And the good news is the Holy Spirit is here to help. That's why we have the Holy Spirit. Finally, as a church, listen, we look like Jesus when we encourage each other because Jesus knows we need encouragement and he encourages us, right? God encourages us. We need to encourage others. The Holy Spirit gives us that. 1 Thessalonians 4.18 says, Therefore, encourage one another with these words. What words? What the Bible says. What God's word says. I speak it to each other. We encourage each other. The Holy Spirit gives. This is what the Holy Spirit's come to do. Help us love God. Help us love others. And by the way, there's a play-by-play breakdown that we can evaluate. Am I loving in this way? Am I caring in this way? Am I having harmony in this way? Right? It's all description that we can look at our heart and say, Holy Spirit, what do you want to do in my life? Now, can I challenge you with this? The church looks the most like Jesus when we love God and love others, right? That's when we look the most like Jesus. You guys realize that if our horizontal relationships aren't right, God says our vertical relationship's not right. If you have a broken relationship with another person, God says this relationship is not right either. Remember we said as long as God and I are good, I'm okay. Well, this passage I'm going to read in Matthew chapter 5, verse 23 and 24 says, actually, if you're not good with your brother, God doesn't want any of your worship. Actually, if you're not kind and compassionate and caring and living in community, God says, don't, don't come worship me with that broken horizontal relationship because the vertical relationship is not right. And the Holy Spirit's inside of us to help us understand. Listen to the passage. Jesus says, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar, Old Testament, right? We're in the New Testament now. Old Testament was the Jewish believers would bring like their, their offering to the altar, and that was their act of worship. That was how they worshiped God. And so you were coming to church that morning, right? You're coming to the temple. You're bringing your gift, and you're coming in. And Jesus says, if you're coming in to do this, and you remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift there in front of the altar first, go and be reconciled to them, then come and offer your gift. You see, Jesus is trying to teach his followers, if the horizontal is broken, don't continue to think my vertical worship with God is perfect. Because God says, I don't want the vertical to continue until you fix the horizontal. You're not looking like Jesus until you fix the broken horizontal so that the vertical then is healed because you have to love God and love others. But far too many churches say, I'm just going to love God. I'm just going to love God. I'm going to hate that person. I'm going to be angry at that person. I'm going to have a grudge against that person. And I'm going to be upset with that person. And I'm going to be miserable and nasty. I'm just going to choose to live in my sin, but that's okay because I love God. And I'll just live in my sin over here. See, the Holy Spirit comes into us to help us be the people God wants us to be, and he wants us to love God and love others. And he's there to help and encourage and comfort and counsel and guide and convict and do heart surgery and reveal brokenness and call you to act on it. Leave the gift at the altar. Go and be reconciled. Have the hard conversation. Admit you were a jerk. Talk about the tension or the fr- friction that happened or the, the hurt words that experienced, right? Go and have that to he- let that situation heal. And then you come back and worship God because that's the worship God wants. God doesn't want our worship with broken horizontal relationships. The Holy Spirit doesn't want that to happen. We don't look like Jesus when that happens. We're not the church God called us to be when we just choose to live in compromise and apathy. See, that's why we need the Holy Spirit to keep us on point, to keep us sharp, to keep us focused, to let us evaluate and understand, listen, I need to bring glory to God in my relationship with him and in my relationship with others. 
The Holy Spirit's there, guys. You're sealed with it. You can't walk away from him. He doesn't give up and quit. If he's working in your life, he's going to keep working in your life. Sometimes your hearts get calloused to sin. Sometimes your hearts get full of bitterness. Sometimes your hearts, you're like, man, it's just dead. My heart's a stone heart. I don't even feel anything anymore. Good news, if the Holy Spirit's in there, he can continue to work and convict and challenge and lead and convey because as a church, we've got to look like Jesus. That's why we got the Holy Spirit to help us be able to do that. And in helping us do that, he fixes our relationship vertically and horizontally because that's how we keep this whole book Holy Spirit's here to help us be able to accomplish that. Listen, each week we're giving homework, and this is what our Thrive Groups are talking about. It's going to be a good week at Thrive Group. We're going to talk about real stuff, because at church we are relevant, we're relational, and we're real at Thrive. And so in our Thrive Group, we're going to be talking about real stuff. Listen, we're going to go back to the greatest commandment, and and we're going to read Matthew 22, 34 to 40. And and then, listen, we're going to talk about how are we trying to do this with our willpower, or are we trying to do this with our Holy Spirit power? Which of those two things are we trying to rely on and trust? And then number three, we're going to pray each morning for an opportunity to love others with God's love. If I get up each morning and say, I'm horizontally going to love people the way God has vertically loved people, loved me, man, we would have a different mindset, wouldn't we? And I think the Holy Spirit's there saying, this is what I want you to do, and this is what I want you to do, and this is what I want you to do. And the Holy Spirit's going to help us see those opportunities and move forward with those opportunities. Guys, the Holy Spirit is about change, about changing us to be more like God and and calling us and confronting us and challenging us and leading us forward because God loves us too much to leave us the way that we are. He wants us to look like his son. And as a church, he wants us to accomplish the work that he's put in front of us. Will you pray with me? Lord, your word is powerful. And as we pause we realize that the Holy Spirit can challenge, can convict, can confront. The Holy Spirit can point if our eyes have shifted off of God and we've been distracted and what we think about is who we become and we are not becoming more like Jesus with the things we're looking at and the things we're reading and the things we're consuming. And as a church, we need each other in community And God, our church suffers if people are distracted and if we're not living out these words that your word has given us. Father, I pray that your spirit would do the heart work, the conviction, the heart surgery. Show us the things we need to cut out and eliminate. God, show us the things that we've been struggling with, thinking that we are weaker than, and, and show us that you are greater than and you are more than enough to set us free, to to redeem us, Lord. We we put our faith in you and yet we get so distracted by sin. God, I pray that we would refocus, that we would refresh, even, even renew our faith to you, to recommit our lives to you. It's with a great clarity you call us to love God and to love people. And I pray as a church that we would get focused on those two simple things, that those two commands would drive the unity and the harmony of our church. It would center our effort and our focus. And God, that we would move forward being a light in the darkness, letting people see what it looks like for a group of people to really follow the Holy Spirit and love you the way your word calls us to. Father, thank you for not giving up on us, for not quitting on us, for not throwing in the towel. You started the process and you promised to complete the process. And In that journey, you grow our faith and you make us look more like you. So I pray that today would be a day where people are ready to take that next step, moving away from and moving towards, moving away from the hurt and the pain and the the sin in our lives and moving towards you to take a step closer to you in our relationship with you. Father, we praise you for what you do and for what you're going to do as we follow you with all of our hearts. Praise you in the powerful name of Jesus.